I want to welcome you to this opening talk for the exhibition by Krishna Doshi, Architecture for the People. My name is Matteo Kries. I'm one of the two directors of the Vitra Design Museum. And I'm absolutely thrilled and touched that this is the best visited opening talk we ever hosted. Um, those of you who sometimes... <laughs> The only reason for that, of course, is our wonderful guest here tonight, Mr. Balkrishna Doshi, and I'm super happy that he's here with us. The exhibition that we're opening later, and uh, also with his opening talk, is the first retrospective about Doshi's work outside of Asia. And during the last weeks, I've been uh, frequently asked if that had some connection to the Pritzker Prize uh, that Doshi was awarded one year ago. Um, and my answer is no, because such an exhibition takes much more time than one year. So we started before that prize was awarded. And um, also the reasons, uh, of course, are deeper than uh, this prize, as uh, important as it may be. Of course, these reasons are connected to the nearly epic dimensions of the work of um, Doshi. But Krishna Doshi is the foremost Indian modernist architect of the 20th and also of the 21st century. He has created more than 100 buildings over the course of his career. And this career spans over incredible seven decades. He started this career in 1947 when he went from his hometown Pune in India to Bombay to study architecture. And in the 1950s, he collaborated with Le Corbusier and also later with Louis Kahn on their projects in India. He created housing settlements for 10,000s of people, large public institutions, and also tiny single-family housings. He founded architectural universities, and um, his granddaughter, Kushnu, who is the curator of the exhibition, even told me that he's so famous in India um, that when you walk with him through the streets, um, people immediately recognize him. Of course, on one hand, because he's a famous architect, but also because he played in a famous uh, Indian Bollywood movie. <laughs> and the person uh, he acted as an actor was, in fact, himself, um, a famous architect called Balkrishna Doshi. So that's uh, <laughs> how I remember that. And uh, Doshi's relation to Le Corbusier and Louis Kahn, of course, was seminal, seminal for his work. But Doshi did not only and simply um, import their Western modernist architecture aesthetic into India, but he combined this lesson from the West with Indian and vernacular building traditions, with local materials, with different spatial concepts, and above all, with a spiritual and philosophical attitude that is expressed in all of his work. With this symbiosis of modern architecture and local traditions, he contributed to the evolution from one modernist architecture to many modernisms all around the world, which are adapted to local contexts, which take into account specific requirements of different cultures, and which is still inspiring architects until today. One of the main focus of his work is the creation of housing. And this is a global challenge, as you all know. So there are a lot of lessons to be learned from Doshi's work in this field. Not only because this is a global challenge, but also because housing for Doshi is much more than creating walls and space for people to stay in. Housing for him is a philosophical place. It's a place that people should be able to call their home. It's a place where people should be able to found families, to evolve their lives, to have um, their own biographies reflected. And I think this attitude of housing, this approach uh, to housing, is something that you will see reflected in the exhibition as, as one of the many aspects. Another key aspect in the exhibition and in Doshi's work is sustainability. And again, Doshi sees that in a much wider sense than just uh, in the narrow sense of ecological sustainability. He looks at it as something that also um, applies socially and culturally. And this cultural and social sustainability is something which is extremely important in all those different contexts because it is connected to um, the question of meaning, if a building really is meaningful in the situation, in the time, in the place where it is built. All this shows that Doshi, Doshi's thinking is 
transcending architecture, and he's also a teacher. He's a philosopher, he's an institution builder, he's an artist, and you notice all that in his work, and you'd also notice these um, spiritual and deep ethical convictions that he is often um, reflecting in his buildings and which make the spatial creations and the roots within their context so important. So there were many good reasons, as you hear, to realize such an exhibition, and I think these are also a few of the reasons why so many of you have gathered here tonight. For the exhibition that we are opening tonight, a decisive moment came in 2017, when we saw an exhibition of Doshi's work in Shanghai at the Power Station of Art Museum. And this made us start a conversation with Doshi, with his um, granddaughter, Kushnu, and here we are tonight. Um, we realized an exhibition together in about one and a half years' time, which is nothing if you look at uh, how many objects, how many work is in that exhibition and also in the book um, that accompanies uh, the exhibition. And um, we also adapted the, the basis of the exhibition that was shown in Shanghai to the different contexts that we find here, and also to make it travel to other museums after it has been opened here at the Vitra Design Museum. And I'm extremely happy that we, also, we already know the first venue of the exhibition after the Vitra Design Museum. It will be shown at the Architecture Museum of the Technical University in Munich, in the Neue Pinakothek in Munich, from the 17th of October this year until 20th of January um, 2020. I'm happy that the director of the Architecture Museum, Andres Lepik, is here, somewhere in the audience. Ah, hello, Andres. And there's also um, several other museum colleagues here who are discussing with us, bringing the exhibition to their museums. So I think you will hear about the exhibition in the coming years in different museums, and maybe you will have the chance to see them in different spaces. Finally, I want to thank the many partners that were uh, crucial to realize this ambitious exhibition. First of all, I want to thank Kushnu Hof. She's the exhibition curator, she's an architect, she's the director of the Vastu Shilpa Foundation, which has been founded by, by Krishna Doshi. And last not least, she's also Doshi's granddaughter. So thank you, um, Kushnu, for such a great collaboration. It was really an honor. It worked so perfectly across the time zones from India to here. There were many Skype calls and it I think the result really shows how wonderful this um, collaboration happened. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I also want to thank our partner in this exhibition, the Wüstenroth Stiftung, with whom we collaborated on the development of this project early on, and with whom we shared the same interest in the topics in the aspects of Doshi's work that I just mentioned. Housing, sustainability, and uh, the many other facets that you will also see reflected in the exhibition. The Wüstenroth Foundation is also the co-publisher of the exhibition catalog, and I thank Mr. Philip Kurz, the managing director of the foundation, very much for having realized that project with us, and also the members of the board of the Wüstenroth Foundation who are also here tonight. Thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, Chairman Emeritus um, of Vitra, Rolf Fehlbaum, and the founder of our museum. He was the person who um, made us aware of the exhibition in Shanghai. Uh, he was in Ahmedabad to see Doshi, I think one and a half years ago, and came back with a few photographs of that exhibition, and so that was an important a milestone to start the discussion that later then led to the exhibition. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> and my thanks also go to our curator, Jolante Kugler. She was the contact person for Kushnuhof here at the Vitra Design Museum. Um, she had an amazing assistant, Michael Wolfschlag. Where is Michael? Thank you, Michael, also. And together they led the great team at the Vitra Design Museum to realize this exhibition under um, Kushnu's curatorship. So we're really happy to have such a great team which is able to realize these kinds of projects. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> and 
And last not least, of course, my gratitude goes to Balkrishna Doshi, who accompanied the work on the exhibition with an incredibly positive spirit. I, th I think that could be felt throughout the whole process until today, until now, actually. And um, I think this can also be felt within the exhibition that you will later see. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> Okay, having said this, I think it's now time to go over to the main part of this uh, talk with Mr. Doshi and Philipp Ursprung, but let me make three very short announcements before handing over to the two gentlemen. First of all, as you have seen, there is a little pop-up bookstore, so you can purchase the exhibition catalog for those of you who haven't done it in the Schau Depot yet. Um, you will find it here. It's a beautiful book, um, and uh, Doshi also told me uh, that he liked it very much, so we feel really proud and honored to have achieved that. And um, so that's the first thing I want to mention. The other thing is that after the, the talk, of course, there's the exhibition opening at the Gary Building. Um, and um, so, given the fact that there are so many of you here tonight, please have um, uh, understanding that the access to the exhibition may be limited. So at the moment, I think, there are about 250 people in the museum who will have to close the doors and then let people in when other people go out. But please don't start running after the talk, so you're first. Um, and last not least, the exit um, for, uh, to the museum will be here on the right side, so it's not the same way um, how you entered this space. It's here, and then there will be guides showing you the way to the museum. So now it's finally time to start the discussion. Philipp Ursprung, the moderator, is an art historian and architecture theorician, uh, a professor at the ETH Zurich. And please welcome him and Balkrishna Doshi here on the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I will draw this. Good evening. Yes. I'm so glad. <laughs> I am completely it's a, it's thrilled a, and huh? overwhelmed by the response and kind of things that are happening here. Yes, it's, it's a little bit frightening. Yes. <laughs> I'm very honored that, uh, that I can moderate this, this conversation uh, with you, Doshi. It's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, talk with you. It's mutual, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I had the, um, the honor to see the exhibition briefly before, and I was, I was impressed by the incredible uh, variety and, and beauty uh, of, of, your, of your projects. And then, and then I thought, what's, how shall I start this, uh, this conversation? Um, I'm an art historian, uh, not an architect. So for me, uh, design is, is uh, very mysterious, something that I find difficult to understand. So I would like to ask you, how do you design? I think uh, <coughs> I can only remember children. I don't think we teach them design. You give them a piece of paper and some crayons or pencils, and they start doing it. I think what constrains us is that we think that we are designing. But if you start doing what we really love to draw, our eyes are there to see colors, light, space. Our hands want to see movements. Our body wants to look around and see what is happening around. And I think those images will come if we are completely integrated with what we are doing at that moment. At least that's what I have seen with my grandchildren and other people and people who are working on site, for example, in Dhaka, Khan did a beautiful assembly building. And there was a craftsman there sitting, who was carrying bricks. And in that place, in the exhibition, there were pieces of drawings like this with a red ball pen, 
and a very crumpled paper. He had drawn the assembly building the way he perceived. It had nothing to do with either right or wrong or it is a drawing or not drawing. He was absorbing that building so much that it reflected in his gesture. So I think design and drawing is absorption. Absorption with our inner senses. And if we are not, our ego is not there, that this is this and this is right and wrong, I think sketches happen, design happens. And I think that's what I learned from the children. Children always draw. But we make the judgment that this is not right and this is wrong. I think if you go back to the caves, there are cave paintings done by people, you know, in prehistoric times. You see those animals and you see those uh, hunters and others and what power the drawings have. So I think uh, creativity is not limited. What has happened is that we have restricted our vocabulary, our perception. We have restricted our idea that this is what it should look like or not like this. Because we have been trained that what is similar, what is identical, what is photogenic or If you take a picture and it looks same, that is correct. And I think this is where the creativity stops. So when you get a commission, um, institute of of labor, for instance, or or, uh, housing, um, how do you start? I think first of all, when I get any job, any client, I like to know something more about him. Why has he come? Why is he doing things? Does he have any, any interest, you know? Then what kind of life does he live? So he would start telling me about, I want so many rooms. I, and I would say, do you really need rooms or do you need places? And I think the moment you start asking him spaces, then he says, oh no, I don't know. I have a wife, I have children, I have this, and I have a plot, and I have something else next door. Then you ask slowly questions. How do you really go? What is is your family like? Do you meet often? Do you you go somewhere? Do you have interest? And then he starts talking about his interest. And once he starts talking about his interest, the images come, and then you can ask questions. What is that kind of? Is it this high, this is low? Do you think there should be some light? You think, you know, you want to get the breeze there. Do you, do you see the trees in your garden? I will visit his garden. I would go, maybe go and see the plot. And then I would walk with him and start talking about only environment and the way he would start thinking about the kind of activities and responses he would have. And that would give me an idea that this is something that he would like, you know. Because actually, Everything that we build, we build for human beings, basically. We are not doing airport hangars. But when we are doing it for human beings, we know it is taught also to us that there is something called scale, you know, height, how high, low. But we never talk about aspirations. We don't talk about aspirations of people, their relationship with people, their relationship with the nature, or maybe their memories of their other other experiences. So I would ask them the questions about, tell me which, which place do you like most? Where did you go? Do you travel somewhere? And then he would tell me, and then I may go walk around and look at this, or maybe I'll take him to some places, and I would just listen to him, how he's looking. So this gives an idea about the kind of space he would like, kind of color, or maybe the nature, or the opening, or the comfort zone that are there. Very often, when you do some places, you, you ask them a question, what do you do in the evening? What do you do in the afternoon? And what happens to you on Sundays? Because he says, no, but you know, I, have, I share my newspaper with my neighbor. And then you say, but where does the neighbor stay? He says, you know, neighbor stays next door. And I said, how do you go? Do you go out and give him or what? He says, no, 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 we have one platform. So now I'm getting the clue of kind of connections, congeniality that there are, how they get related to the place. Then you ask questions like this about the children and others. So I think this is the way I begin. So it is almost uh, an 
analysis uh, you 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 learn about it's the It's a beha behavior behavioral pattern and the kind of uh, inclination that they have about the kind of place i don't ask them about money the cost or the space it because i had i had a client i had done very interesting project when i was working when there was a law which came about the land parcel the corvisage building was a, located in a very big land and so in the parcel they had to cut some land and give it to the government but rather than giving to the government they sold those into five five parcels of 500 square yards of plot and only condition was that i should design those buildings so first time that i met them one was a jeweler one was a sales tax officer one had a dairy business so one one person had two families one person had one son was given to get married so i talked to them for an hour or two hours then i wanted to know but what would you like after five years or ten years slowly you know you begin to unfold their images their imageries but also they say but eventually he may not stay there so there are all kinds of questions come up integrate questions about life future past and then you have, i was thinking that if i have to do this and next to corbusier's buildings how do i do the building i have to make it very simple but i should not make each one look different but it can be similar looking in that period of time that is one has, one has to also look at what period of time you are designing this building that's for myself and then the question came that if i had to design so i had already made limitations for myself now i have variations there so there have to be some similarities in the appearance for so distance when you drive you see that, that they look similar but not really very obvious but as you go in each building happens to look very different because they have their own characters the reason I do that because it is like, you know, you buy jewelry. Very often you buy a ring or something, you choose. And I think that relationship between the person who is going to be there and the environment that it is there, I think it should be congenial. I think this is one of the roles which we don't look at it, you know, in the present context, saying how many rooms and how much money you have and what is the cost. And we just look at it casually because we are trained, unfortunately, like that that we think, you know, that we have to create a product, but we have forgotten the process. We have forgotten that for it is also living organism. I call architecture not as a building, but as a habitat, a living organism. It is because if, if, you, if you are having this place here, naturally it is so well made and such a fine thing, but it doesn't have anything to say that there's no echo, there's no response. So I think uh, surfaces, buildings, surrounding, the landscape, when you make a window, you see the outside. Now outside is also yours, because you can look into this. So uh, there are no limits to this. Mm -hmm. It's a question of, is the architect trained with limitations or is the architect opened up for the environment? So you have, uh, you have this um, study of the behavior, you have this knowledge about the, the wishes and uh, the life of the client and uh, at, at some moment you have to make a decision uh, to, yes, to propose sure, something. Sure. Um, does, does this always uh, respond to what the client imagined or is this something which he might uh, think this is not what I was, was expecting? No, the client has a dream. He is wanting to realize that dream within the budget that is there. So there are little limitations of place, location, etc. But when he has that dream, he also wants to have that he will be happy there. So in undercurrent is that it is a happiness that is required. And familiarity is only one which can give you happiness. So the questions are familiar, questions are peculiarities. And that actually is a very interesting phenomena I found to generate ideas, generate thoughts. Supposing I was writing a story, then I can write a story about that life and then perhaps give it to him or show him or talk to him. So I don't do buildings as per building as a product, but I try to create for myself. Do I enjoy this? Will I live there? Will I be happy there? I think it's not one-way traffic, it's two ways. Mm -hmm. Quite tough.
sometimes disastrous, but it works. <laughs> and on, on this way, uh, on this way, is there is there dead ends? Is there moments when you say, okay, this doesn't work, I have to change it? Do, do you make uh, models and test yes, it? Yes. Uh, yeah. I make big models, openable models. And then sometimes he will say, I don't like it. Sure. But then you have to think, what does he like? Then I would go with him or I'll ask him, what is it that you like? Tell me. One thing I learned from Louis Kahn was, he says, become friend with the client if you want to realize your dreams. And I have not forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> so the, um, the matter that you, you're working is, is um, it, it's building materials, it's, but it's also um, it's, it's memories, it's expectations. Uh, in a way, it's always about space. Huh? Um, can, can you give a definition of, of what space means for you? No, I can take him to the place where he has come. If he has come to my office, I would take him around the office, you know, or I would take him to another place that he likes. I think it's good to know more and more through examples, live examples. Because if he is living in a city or if he is living outside or if he is living in some place, you may not know. But it is good to know because most important thing is the relationship between the architect, the, the designer and the user. And I think unless we become part of that family, I think it doesn't work. And there is a challenge of creativity. How do you really create something that, you know, he, not only that he thought about it, but now he got something else. Mm -hmm. And I had clients from beginning, you know, in the low cost housing and then to private buildings and then public buildings. The issue is the same. You're looking at the surroundings, you're looking at the place, you're looking at the kind of behavioral pattern that may happen, whether it is an auditorium that you do in a public space, or whether you do a school or whether you do a hospital or whatnot. I think you can do that because you, you want to want, as an architect, what is my training actually? I am not an expert. I am also only known about such skills. So your skills also need to be enriched by different kinds of things that are required. So, for example, an architect, or I tell my student that the architect has to walk through the streets, visit the old places, visit extended places, and, and observe what is it that is affecting you in every way. So it's not only, only talking about dimension and a client and a product. So okay. the role, role is not really an architect only. He is also a, talking about social concerns. For example, you make two rooms and uh, the rooms are in such a way that somebody has to go other way around and there is a couple or something. I think they, they feel terrible about things. The questions are, you have to be part and parcel to know really what are the things which are congenial, what are not there. If we could, do you want to make a long distance walk, you know, to allow people to get lost or get angry? Or do you want to bring them not so close, but just the distance? It's like, actually, one is creating an organism like plant, you know. How does one, the plant wants to have the sunlight and not sunlight? How does a plant behave and what happens to, it's completely different when you ask a Japanese to talk about a bonsai plant. Mm -hmm. And they, they mentioned to me that we leave that plant fully and then we know what to cut, what not to cut. So it's a question of dynamic balance. And so, building doesn't, it is not temporary. Building is long lasting. How long is the time horizon of your imagination? How, lo how long do you think that your I think sometimes, you know, I, do, I may do work with him more than a year, two years. I may not do less than that. Mm -hmm. I would take that much time. And how long do you think the building lives? It will take also a year or two years. Mm -hmm. Not many clients come, but those who come, they stay. <laughs> 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 so teaching, of course, w w uh, teaching is, is an important uh, part of your, your career and uh, it's, it's an important part of, of your of life and practice to share what you find out with, with, um, with, um, with your students. Uh, so how does a, uh, 
how does a teaching let's, day let's uh, look work at it, with you? Let's look at it that, that the, the, the person who wants to build a school is my client. And the students are the ones, you know, the functions are there. So first thing is that, you know, really what do the students want? They want to wander anywhere. They want to get lost. They are searching, they want to get lost. So do you really make doors? So in the school that I designed, there was a Westland used property, a campus property, but I said, you give me this client. The client was my own other client. So I said, this, this place which is lying tired and this old ancient brick kiln, I said, why don't you give me that land? He says, why, why don't you take care? I said, no, give us this parcel of land. The reason was, I thought this brick kiln is not there, it looks very dirty, but it is on the corner of a property. And I thought that if it is located on the corner of the property, it is on the crossroads. So it gives you a clue that people can cross. And the moment they cross, and if they see this brick kiln, and supposing that I make this into rolling grounds, and if I make lawns, so I made a model and then lawns came when the building was finished. So questions are, how do you transform the place, the landscape or the place around, and then how do you create variety of things that you think that you would like to have? So I always do things for myself. They are made for the client, but I like to celebrate. So levels, vast vistas, green spaces, evenings, you know, you see there is a road, so I, I planted a large number of trees. Then the next question is, I would like to have a shadow because of the hot sun. Then you want to have breeze to flow through. Then you would like to have a nice proper natural light. So rather than doing like this and putting light, you have a natural light like in the industry. So elements that I thought are, I would love to have, I would like to provide them in the campus so that in the campus over time, the student will also learn that these are the ones came. So design comes after the project, after the ideas have been thought of, their methods of realization is thought of, and then the, you try to put them together, and then it happens. So it's very natural way of working. So this is, uh, is very close to the, the approach of an, of an artist, no? Uh, uh, you have a, you want to look at something, you, you want to make something which you like. Uh, this this uh, relates to how also artists work. Now you, you trained as a, as a painter, uh, if I'm uh, Yeah, I started right. like that, yeah, yes. Yeah. So you still have a, a kind of an, a frame uh, for artworks that you would like to make in the medium of architecture with you, or is this something it different? It is always, you know, I think uh, things have to look very good. They have to, I don't want to use the word beautiful, but I would say delight. Mm -hmm. I think there should be joy, they should become magnet. And everybody must be curious, you know, they must say what is inside, what is not there. That is how really you create spaces. That's how you use the light. Sunlight is one place, but how do you create the sunlight which reflects on the wall, goes down below or goes somewhere else? So you're really molding these things in your mind. It's like a movie, it's like making a stage set. Mm -hmm. So if you do these things, then, then things become easier. And it also becomes, if you're the, the school of architecture which I founded, I was the architect and I wanted to show what I could do. It was a simple building done, even today everybody likes it. But the idea was, what would I enjoy most? Mm -hmm. And what would others would enjoy most? And then they will add on to that their own additions. You say so, it, so. So building an architecture is not. It is something plus. Mm -hmm. If it is not plus, then it is not correct. But you don't use the word beauty. You say delight rather. It's delight, like, I yeah. would use because yeah. beauty. Then you can say, oh, this is ugly and not ugly. Experience. You know, when we are talking, the word that word doesn't come. When you are arguing, then we say, I don't like and like. Mm -hmm. I think it should be like shaking hands. Mm -hmm. So you don't say architecture, you say habitat. Yes. Uh, uh, so there is, uh, you, you try to avoid these, these words that are 
you know, too much used, perhaps, or, or yes. too, too... And the other word I use is celebration. Celebration. Celebrating habitat. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't celebrate, what is the use? And then the client never asks you about cost. <laughs> because he loves it so much that he borrows money also. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have, um, you talk about the clients uh, that, that have time, that, that uh, share perhaps your aesthetics, but you also build for clients that have very little choice. You yes, work for, yes. the, you say, for the poorest of the poor, those yes. that uh, we tend to not even see. Uh, not even uh, talk about. Uh, can you uh, explain um, us how this kind of work uh, happens and takes place? You know, poor, <coughs> even poor are human beings, isn't it? <laughs> so, if, if there is a delight and the human being has, can't afford, the first question is, is it possible that there are occasions when the government is there and there are migration, people have come and government wants to give them a place to live? It's an obligation of the government, so they can do anything. So normally what people do is, okay, we give you shelter. So shelter means uh, not necessarily properly organized not properly designed and say, how much space, you know, so you can start saying, look, I don't think he needs more than this space because my obligation is over. I don't know whether he's going to live there or not, but that is what it is. I have never thought, I mean, the government will not think about that he is going to live there for long or he will have a, a, some kind of an addition or he will have children there maybe. Maybe he wants to have a little more place to put a photograph or a cook his place, etc., etc. So his life is like our life. Unfortunately, he's poor. But he also is a community. He also is connected to his other poor friends. Maybe all are poor, but they also want to sing and dance. They also want to, to cherish something together. They also have marriages. So they are sharing things. So the moment you start thinking now, you are not thinking a poor, you are thinking a community of poor people who want to enjoy life and they want to live together. So the next question comes, what kind of a street does he have? And what kind of a other people who are living across will have? Will they have conversations? Will they have something else to say? So and then you will say, I think, you know, if they have a little plinth, so they can sit down and chat across and share dialogues because the person may go to work, but his wife may be at home, or maybe children are there. So you begin to then think about not only a room and a house, but you begin to think about the street, then you think about the neighbors, then you think about the places, then you think about a little shop, then you think about a community hall. And that is how the origin actually happens in societies. So if one thinks that it is not at micro level, but it is at macro level, eventually happens. So architect's job is not to think about an element in isolation, but it has to go right up to metropolis. And, and if, he, if he thinks like this, if he thinks like this, then whole idea comes as a composite thing. And that is how old cities were built. That is how all, the, all over the world we find ancient cities. So if one was talking about a poor person then, you are also thinking about employment, you are also thinking earning, you are also thinking about his education. So you ask those questions and then maybe it is one small, but then I would go to the client, the officer, the committee, and explain to them that what would happen in two years, five years, 10 years. And they actually, if you spend time and convince them, they would consider those things. So then that plan has become now a little settlement. 
So you have to you have to think quite quite ahead also with them about what is going to how this uh, settlement is going to change over time. No, for instance, when the one is less poor or more wealthy, or when when there's change, and how how do you keep in mind all those those well, uh, you, we, elements? We walk around and we observe. I think our job is also to observe things. You see, comprehensively we should work. The thought has to be comprehensive, in which time and space are restrictions perhaps, but they are not final restrictions. If it is done properly, accommodation happens. Because who wants the, their place to be dirty? Who wants their place to be not hygienic? I think they all want something which is very beautiful eventually. Maybe there are some people there, you know, who also do as a part-time gardener's job. They might plant a sapling and it may be a little tree. See, we have, I think as an architect over time, with my experience, I have found that over time, aspiration overrules everything. All achievements have come born out of aspiration. And that aspiration is to have a good environment, joyous place, a place where you could thrive. So there's this uh, um, aspiration also to a kind of an uh, of an equilibrium of of a balance in, in life. Uh, today uh, um, there's a lot of discussion about uh, sustainable uh, or resilient architecture. You, you've been doing this uh, since 40 years, no? Yes, yeah. sustainability is comprehensive thinking. When it is isolated, then it is not sustainable. I think. When you make a building, you cannot forget the sun or the wind or the neighbor or the street or the future. Because everything grows, everything changes, everything transforms, everything can be readjusted and evolved and molded. But it is never a micro scale. Architect has to think at macro scale. At macro? Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you know, all, all over, for example, examples of uh, your cities, you know, here in Europe, I think they are planned, you know, over time, and they have built it that way. Mm -hmm. In our case, you know, we don't do, and therefore we always come into crisis, and then finally we find traffic jams, and we find uh, unhygienic conditions, we find uh, uh, people, you know, who have nothing, so they spill over things. So in, in my school at ETH, we, we, we make a clear separation between the urban planners, the architects, the landscape architects, the circulation and traffic planners. They Should we change that? Of course. Yeah. You, have to, you have to have them as an integral thing. In our school, we started, so we started with architecture, we started with urban planning, then we had planning, then we had environmental planning, then we have... A, Climatology, then interior design, uh, then we have visual art center, then, con then music. We think, you know, that how, why should we think architecture is only building? Are we building tombs which cannot grow? I think that's what it is. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, currently there's a hundred years uh, Bauhaus uh, celebrations happening. Uh, Bauhaus is also a case where many. Uh, I know. Subjects come together. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you, no, the Bauhaus. But what I would say, with due regards, you know, in this, behind my thinking, there is a big role by Bauhaus. Mm. There's no question. Kandinsky, Paul Clay. Gropius and all other architects, you know, I think I have had some people whom I knew. And when we started another institution in India, we had called those people also. And I think the whole idea is evolving curriculums, expanding uh, idea ideologies, and all the time trying to do things which are additionally required it is like our creating biological being, where you go on adding and they are added, but then they are integrated. I mean, the head comes here, but it is integrated. So I think if one can do that, and if one can start thinking about that in life, I think the situation would become very different.
But what happens, restrictions come of whether economy or politics or maybe actual situation, and then we neglect them. So, if you think that we are talking about not architecture per se, because architecture, then we talk music, etc., but we talked about habitat, then everything comes, you know. I mean, we are full of all those things in our own very being. And I think if we can do that, I think then it's not difficult. It may take time, it may have different scales, and it will also evolve. So this is a plea for a really expanded notion of, of architecture, which uh, doesn't uh, stick to disciplines. Um, sh <laughs> sh shall we open the discussion to the room? Does this work? I think, yes. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a factory, no? It's a factory. Uh, and you, you like labor work, no? You, this is something which is, is very important in your architecture. So we, we should profit from this fact that this is this uh, factory place. Um, yeah, so I cannot really see, but that doesn't matter. Is there a question? Yeah, here, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Doshi, that I insist uh, in this case. I go back to the beginning of the 1960s when the NID was founded in Ahmedabad yes. and your School of Architecture was founded one year ago. And I was reading a lot, searching how was the involvement of the Ford Foundation that was very heavy in the NID. I think this story is well documented. But I could not find anything of the involvement in your school foundation. But what I think, or what us, yeah, what I think is that also when Louis Kahn came to um, Ahmedabad, they came, they were sent by the Ford Foundation. And I read your past Uncharted, some other books, but this story is, is not told, I think. And uh, maybe you can answer me later this question or now. Um, I, it was the Ford Foundation as well so much involved in the founding of the School of Architecture in 1962? And my second question, uh, Christopher Benninger, who started the uh, School of Planning 10 years later in your School of Architecture, he was a Ford Foundation advisor. So I, I like to know a bit about that history with Ford Foundation. Okay. <laughs> you, you would like to know more about the, the S development of the campuses? Uh, Support no, that, that supporting Support system. No, I, I fully Ford agree Foundation. with you. I think uh, I had gone to meet uh, Prof. Dr. Ensminger then in 1962 in Delhi. And when I was talking to him, and uh, then he was asking me about faculty and other programs, and that was the time when I explained to him and two things I explained to him. I said, I only hire or I would get those who come to the room standing with their head straight so that they can answer and reply and then they could tell me about the future vision. And that is how then he gave us a grant to add on the School of Planning Wing. And I think it is possible what I was, if I pick up from there and I say, that help comes from places. If the basic intentions are covering the larger context, and the larger context is the society in which we live. And I think we never, as a professional, usually, as a professional, don't think much larger, because larger means, am I able to do? Will it happen by me? Will I get the help? All the questions come. But if there is a faith, it can happen. And I think uh, this, this place, Vitra, is an actual live example of how slowly and one idea can grow and it becomes global. And I think that's what you know, institutions are for. I don't know whether I have answered your question. <laughs> um, hi, hi, sir. Um, I for young architects like me from India, um, I know you've written a lot about it and also spoken about Can it. Can you but come a little for, uh, forward? And, because I, I have a problem of hearing. Uh, okay. um, for, young, for, 
for cool. young architects like us, uh, especially from India, um, I think we're in the middle of a change where uh, you know you are constantly modernizing, contemporizing, also learning um, modern things, new technologies. But at the same time, I think we find ourselves grappling with this um, how to kind of um, stick to your roots in a way. And how does that reflect in Indian architecture or, I mean, universally in any culture? And how would you then define, let's say, a language for Indian architecture? How do you suggest that people like us uh, attempt to define something like that? Can, I, can you, did you understand this? Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because I am not, uh, I don't know what, you are asking a lot of questions and all the time saying how. <laughs> I am, I, I'm only going to say, why are you not finding it? <laughs> I mean, well, who is stopping you from finding? That is my question. Do you have a method? Pardon? Do you have a method to finding this balance no, between tradition and modern? No, just do it. Just do it. Modern? Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> 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 You have Hello. something, we can start something. We can, we can also. Um, one question which uh, I wanted to ask, uh, um, but I forgot, but I will ask it now. The, the, we've heard uh, often that you go uh, from uh, your home country to, uh, to France, to Paris, and then you work there. Um, why don't you stay in, in Europe? I tell you, I, I joined the School of Architecture when we, that year was the independence year, and I was uh, 18 year old. And independence meant a lot to me because I had seen the pre-independence movement struggles and the fights and burning and killing and whatnot. Second thing is that if you want to do something, should we not try something which is more possible? Because the land had all the opportunities. Opportunities were there. Because it was growing, it was expanding, it had a vision, Corbusier was already there. Other thing is that there, we always were connected to our own culture, and I had seen the buildings built by the Britishers and the other people and architects who came from outside. And uh, I was thinking that if I have to so what I learned about form, space, light, color, textures, and also the kind of reinterpreting all this in the Indian context, I analyze a lot of things. I analyze temples, I analyze villages, I analyze towns. And I found that there was a different kind of connection between the way the spaces are used and the spaces that I was taught with. When there is a pedestrian and when there is a village, then they talk about the village and the common place and the small water tank or a well, and how they would use in the mornings and afternoon, and how the festivals would happen under the tree. So I realized that it is not only the question of a theory or a practice of an inert matter, but the practice of looking at live things which are happening. In seasons, we have <coughs> we have a lot of seasonal festivals, and those seasonal festivals happen before or after the season is over, and the intentions were many many reasons for that. Now, if those festivals are happening, and if there are people of diverse views and cultures are coming together, why are we not advancing that into a bigger thing, and why not really teach them new things which came from Bauhaus and others? So it was really those intentions that I had to do, and therefore I expanded that kind of an idea. And the school came as in between. Yeah. I, uh, so the, the second question that relates to that is that usually we hear what, what you learn from Corbusier. What do you think does Corbusier learn from you? <laughs> I think naivety, 
I was a naive person. And so he was asking me questions about village, he was asking questions about uh, other places. And I would tell him about my, my family life, you know. So I was talking to him about how the extended family, how the buildings were added on, how the space was made, how a village was, how the cultures were. So he would listen to this, but we were designing the buildings. I was working on the plan, which is completely different. <clears throat> but then uh, one day when the, and I never realized this, you know, until very recently, uh, the buildings that he did in Ahmedabad, there were four type of houses which were built by him at the same time. In one day, he got those commissions of designing two houses, one for a bachelor, one for an old lady, respected lady, one from the municipality to do a museum, and one for the textile industries association uh, for the office building. Now, four different types, four different situations, and here is of his working on these four. And it is one of the greatest example of what somebody can do. He developed four different typologies. The only thing, one was the Sarabhai house was an old lady. So he says the old lady loves garden, so let us give a garden to her. Let us have a house which is so insulated that you can make a grass on top of the roof. Let the wind comes through and let the wind blows through. And then he, he said that, perhaps he said, but not said, but you can feel that it should be very quiet and it should have nothing. It is one of the simplest, easily built, most comfortable architectural example that I have ever seen. And it is today, everybody says it is one of a masterpiece, but you can't make out, there's no aesthetically thing. It's all connected to absolute livability in silence. And you enjoy the appearance and the appearance because if the walls are staggered, you move there. When the light comes and breeze comes there, you don't, and very intimate, not even pompous. On the other hand, there was a bachelor and who wanted to have a house. And so he one day tells, you know, about Arabian nights, you know, so you have parties and this, that, that. And that time, I showed him one Indian miniature showing how terraces are used. So he looked at that drawing very carefully. And then he created the whole building, which was the first time in the architectural profession, in our profession, everybody talked about in the USA when I was teaching there, that terraces are made and then there is a parasol like you have an umbrella. Now it is an ordinary thing that when there is a sun, we carry in, the, in our city's umbrella. He created that umbrella in the part of the structure and part of this theory of cube. The museum which is there, you know, which was made, it had a museum needs a artificial light, but it has to be climatically controlled. So he makes double walls. He lifts the building up. So the breeze from there goes to the way central courtyard. Then there is a light there and on top he creates hydroponics so that the roof also can be used. Now, this was done, and the last one was the uh, other house, uh, uh, the um, Milonas building, in which, you know, he talked about the river, the place around there, and he talked about how on a river, if you have a land, but you want to show, you have to see the river, how do you bring it closer? So he extends the ramp, like you extend the hand, and suddenly the building begins to look closer, and you appear there, and you look at the river. So. Over time, only maybe 10 years, 15 years ago, I realized the subtle nuances and how creativity can come by itself if you ask these questions. And then your imagination makes that happen. And that's really the great lesson that I learned. Yeah. Do we have another question yet? So we have to wait for the microphone, just a second, but we have a question here first, so he started already. I'll come to you later, just a second. Yes, hello. What, what Over here. <laughs> um, it is lovely to hear you tell these, uh, these stories, and it is related to, um, to this. Um, what is the role of... Uh, Can you come forward, please, so yes. I understand better? <laughs> 
what is the role of uh, narrative and of storytelling in architecture in general and in your practice in specific? If you had to go now to buy something for somebody and you go when you don't find money and you come back and you don't want to hurt, would you not create a story? <laughs> 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 no, the whole idea is architecture is an unexpected experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't know, the client doesn't know. And now you have to conjure something to think how to begin with. So I always then try to create a myth, because that is all I know, that if you sleep, close your eyes, something happens. And that myth is not necessarily an effort. It is not... Actually, we are all born, you know, to talk stories. All our epics talk about stories. And every day, we also want to narrate somebody and engage him for a longer period. We narrate a story. We create a story. So it is not something special. What you need to do is to find out what is it that will create unexpected situations within the spaces, outside the space, and how would suddenly disappear? It's a theater, and that theater is what we have to do. And it can be narrow or big or small. What happens is that we are taught not this, we are not taught about theater, we are taught about architecture, talking about function, climate, technology, and its effectiveness, and we talk about that it is comfort country. Those are all additions which you can always do. So we get bogged down by those, and our tools are given that we are given dimensions. So there's no game. So everything is, this is a functional table here. So anything extra is cut off. But if this is added two more feet, it can make a wonder. We don't know. But when it comes to eating food, we always look at the food plate and we add a little spices and it becomes completely different. Architecture is not different from life. It's everyday thing. We have one last question here. So in Hello. your architecture, we can see the project as a process, able to keep together the uniqueness of places plurality of way of life and universality of forms in the perspective, in a spiritual perspective. What is tradition then? I think uh, a complex question, but <laughs> no, because, you know, if I, if I follow the rules, if I follow the same road, which has been followed by generations together. And even though it is crooked, I want to drive my car there. Then this is like saying that I am not following the tradition of a pavement, foot, footpath, I mean, the, the pedestrian, because I am not going meandering way, and I am going by the straight road. So the question is, traditions have come over a long period of time, through series of uh, situations and circumstances. And those circumstances have given us some kind of memories and notions. And I think that is how tradition continues, because tradition is really, uh, for example, in our daily life, our daily routine, because we are looking at the sun and the moon or, and the sky. So we live as a diurnal activity traditionally, because that is what we are supposed to be connected. So it questions are that, what are the traditions which we would like to follow, which are effective for our body? And what are the traditions we follow because they look good and because we think, you know, that there was something meaningful. And then there is another tradition which we call either heritage or something we call, no, imitation, that it is quite good. So it's a classical building or a contemporary building or building made of glass. I think the differences are those. And I think that is what one has to learn, that do we really do for what purpose? Does it have any more meaning than what you want to do, something which is added on, plus? 
and something that which gives you another chance to experiment. And I think those are the things which we don't look at. But those are all large questions which need a, a kind of a different dialogue. Thank you. Um, I was one last question because not all of my students could come here and they will probably ask me next week. What, what is your advice to a young student of architecture? I think first thing is that he should travel, see things, see how different people live at different places and how they have found some things, uh, joy, how do they live the place, outdoor space, indoor space. At least that's what I learned. After leaving Corbusier, I traveled through Italy and I took almost a month going around. I was searching, you know, the kind of resolution that came, I think how a farmer would live in an Italian place or how a piazza would be used and how the kind of crossroads would come and there would be coffee shops and others. So, and how there will be a monument and the, how the gathering would happen. I think all these things are very important to learn. I think they are big lessons to learn. Second is that what kind of things gives you joy? What kind of a thing gives you an intrigue? For example, mystery, the stories which have, people have written about mysteries and the movies are there like Alfred Hitchcock and all that. I think those are also very important because sudden revelations create for you another kind of image. I think those are other ones of stories. Then there are other things which are there, like you go to New York and Corbusier wrote about it in the cathedral, when the cathedral were white. And he looked at those towers at that time, and then he says, why the towers are so small? Why are they not made double? Now, what he was asking was, is there the technology, then can the technology be far beyond? But similarly, those public spaces which were there, can they also become as glorious? I think glory is very important in life. If there is no gloriousness, you know, if there is no buoyancy, if there is no charm, you know, that is there, I think those are the things I would think young person must do. Second, he should also work somewhere in actual construction to know how things are built. Then he should also go out and go in hot summer and go into the shade and know what is the difference. So architecture is really complete that way that you learn from body, mind and spirit and then you will understand this. So it's an integral thing. For me, architecture is an integral experience, not just isolated experience. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you Dorothy. Thank you. I can't see you, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I offer you. Thank 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 you. Now I can see them. I check when you are, you don't see them. No, no, I can see them now. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Lastly, I would like to thank everybody here. How many of you have come today for both of us? And Matteo explained everything. But I'm really thrilled tomorrow morning my family and myself, we are going back. I wish we had bought the ticket of one week later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>